I'm Michelle McLean from Casey Kidinia Libraries, and it's my pleasure to introduce Jane Rivett Karnak, who's currently president of the Narry Warren and District Family History Group, who's presenting today on the Great War, 1914-1918, its impact on the Casey Kidinia region told in the stories uncovered in five local cemeteries. Jane, over to you. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning. Now, in 2014, with the 100-year commemoration of World War I, the Narry Warren and District Family History Group began to research soldiers with connections to Berwick Cemetery. We had plans to tell their stories during a cemetery walk and publish the findings. This grew into a four-year project over five local cemeteries, the stories of over 500 men and a small number of women who served. It opened our eyes to the broader impact the war had on those waiting at home and the struggles some of the returned men had after the war. Their stories covered every aspect of the war. The early months were full of enlisting, rejections, farewells and optimism for the war that it would be over quickly, but it was not to be. Some of our local men enlisted within a few days of the war being declared in August 1914, while English men living in Victoria that were still reservists in the English army also rushed to enlist or in, arranged to return to their units in England. To enlist in the army for overseas service, you had to be 21 or have written permission from your parent or guardian. Edward Denali said he was 22 when he enlisted in the army. He must have looked older than that because he was only 16 and a half. He enlisted in 1916 and on the 20th of September 1917, he was wounded and died the next day. The Navy had different requirements. John Glissman joined the Royal Australian Navy at the age of 16 in 1911 and signed on for seven years. He also served in the Navy during the Second World War. Edwin Nurse was the first of seven Victorian boys to be accepted as a Naval Midshipman Cadet at the age of 13 on the 31st of December 1912. He also served in both wars and retired aged 57 after 44 years of continuous service. We found three other local men serving in the Navy. When Charles Lyon enlisted in the army at 18, his recently widowed mother gave her permission, even though his three older brothers were already overseas. And she had seven children under 14 still at home, but she said yes. But he was not to go overseas until he turned 19. Charles' brother Leslie was killed in October 1918 on his 23rd birthday, and their brother Patrick died of wounds a year earlier. When the Second World War started, once again their mother waited, this time for her three youngest sons. Thankfully, they all returned. Stanley Thayer was also 18. Both his parents had died, so his aunt gave permission, again with the proviso he not leave until he was 19. He spent his service overseas as a clerk in the War Records Office in London. And it wasn't just young men who were putting up their age to enlist, but older men who dropped their age. Robert Pringle said he was 44 years and seven months. At the time, you had to be under 45. He was in fact 56. He had two sons serving overseas. Arnold enlisted in 1914 and Frederick the following year. Robert enlisted in 1917. Six months after he arrived in England, his eldest son Arnold died of wounds. A month later, the army discovered Robert's true age and sent him back to Australia. A number of men in their late 40s served in the remounts at Maramanong on the ships carrying the horses in the Middle East and of course in Egypt. Some also served in England. It took a large number of working men as vets, shoeing smiths, farriers, breaking in and training the thousands of horses, mules and donkeys. Edward Rossiter was a man who was a trainer back in Australia. He served from 1914 to 1916 in Egypt. He said he was 48, but he was 59. When Norman Beaumont was rejected on medical grounds, he paid his own way to England and was employed as a trainee chemist in a munitions factory in Scotland for the duration of the war. We could wonder, did some young men enlist because their father had been on the local recruitment committee? 
The sons of George Lyon, Lewis Fink and William Henry also enlisted. George's only son, Charles, he died after the Battle of Bathsheba. The other two sons returned, although William's son didn't come back until late 2019 as he was a German POW. Our research uncovered other men who were POWs. William Petman and Harold Garman both were interred in Germany. Keith Carr was a prisoner of the Turks. They all returned home. Lewis Carson returned from the World War War. He had mental health issues and a lot of the men did. And he sought peace on an island off Papua New Guinea. During World War II, he was taken as a civilian prisoner by the Japanese. And he died when the Montevideo Maru, which was transporting prisoners to Hanan Island in Japan, was torpedoed and sunk. It was not carrying identification of a Red Cross and was believed to be an enemy ship. Everyone on board perished. In 1918 at the Royal Melbourne Show, they held the empty saddle appeal because even though the war was still going and it was getting very tiring, they were running out of recruits. They led a riderless horse around the showgrounds. Edward Hallier responded to this call. He was 18. His father gave permission, but asked that he not go to camp for a month so he could help him get his potato crop in. And it noted that his brothers were already overseas. A lot of men were rejected on health issues, mainly eyesight, teeth and feet. Before they could start basic training, some opted for medical procedures to rectify an issue. Dentist Ernest Callanan enlisted and was one of the earliest dentals in the, dentists in the medical corps. He worked for 19 months at the number five general hospital in St Kilda Road, fixing teeth and dentures before men could commence training. It was vitally important that you had a good grip on the mouthpiece of a gas mask. Ernest also served overseas. Apart from young men who suffered from malaria, dysentery, fever, the flu and trench foot, many young men caught the mumps while in camp or overseas. A combination, a compl complication of the mumps for some men meant that later in life they were unable to father a child. Some men started training with old injuries and they flared up and they were then discharged. A few men were rejected as being unsuitable. Those rejected, apparently healthy men, would often unfairly be tarred as shirkers and cowards. The spiritual needs of the men were also important. Chaplain William Gunson held church services, buried the dead. He kept detailed records of burials. He wrote to wives and families. He collected, bagged up and noted a man's possessions for it to be returned home. He visited the men in the casualty clearing stations, the field hospitals behind the lines. He listens to the men's concerns and arranged entertainment and activities. George Pickett was another young minister and he tried to actually enlist in the army on five occasions. On the sixth occasion, they finally accepted him and assigned him to the Australian Field Ambulance. He served on the front line until November 1917. He then returned to his calling and was promoted to as a captain chaplain and ministered for the Church of England on, in France until the end of the war. At the end of the hostilities, many soldiers then volunteered for the Graves Detachment and stayed on duty until the end of 1920. Thomas Kelly and Robert Gray were two of these men tasked with locating isolated graves, removing the soldiers to be reburied in the various new military cemeteries that were being established. When an unidentified soldier had a headstone, it had known only to God. If they knew who he was, the family would ask if they would like to provide a few words to be inscribed. The inscription on Robert Harker's grave was provided by his parents and was deemed too long. The military only allowed for 66 characters, which included spaces and punctuation. Hence, so many of them are very brief. Robert Munro was with the engineers when he stayed behind after the war at Les Fontaines in France. He stayed until April 1919 with a unit that was repairing 60 bridges and culverts, inspecting wells and pumps. 
He was also possibly looking for his younger brother, Lachlan, who'd been reported missing in October 1917. His sister had written to the military, mother is breaking her heart, it is his youngest son. His body was recovered in 1923. Private Hill enlisted late in 1918 and was discharged at Christmas. He then re-enlisted and served in Rabaul as a garrison butcher until 1921, while Australia provided civil and administration and military support to the fledgling country. He was hospitalised for a number of months on his return from malaria. When Colin Caddy recovered from his war injuries, he worked as a dispatch clerk with the Red Cross for 29 years. He retired in 1949, designated as TPI, or totally and permanently incapacitated on a full pension. Bruce Smith enlisted in 1916. He was medically discharged in 1917. Two years later, he re-enlisted as a clerk in the base records office at St Kilda Road. A number of young men enlisted under aliases for a variety of reasons. William Francis Carr was also known as William Edward McEwen. Sidney Charles Barr or Jack Frisch Fisher was in the Navy when he deserted his ship in Sydney, made his way to Adelaide and enlisted in the Army. Arthur Edward Hilrick or, or Arthur George Leckie in 1916 lied about his age, said he had no idea where his parents were. He returned and died when he was hit by a train in 1924 between Berwick and Narry Warren. Frederick Waite or William West, Robert Crozier or George Hope. George died at sea on his way home. He fell overboard. He was returning suffering with shell shock. His brother had to sort out his affairs and prove who he was to enable the probate on his will. And there was Thomas Brigese who served as Thomas William and countless other men did it as well. Every day the newspaper reported on every aspect of the war, initially the names of men going into camp at Broadmeadows or Sundry, reports on local farewells, the speeches and gifts, watches, wallets and money belts, practical things like a pocket knife or can opener, for many of them a medallion from their community wishing them all the best. Later, the listings of the names of the wounded, the missing and the killed grew. It filled whole pages. Letters from home were printed in the paper, initially full of positivity as the young men set off. They soon became filled with longing to return and fleeting references to hardship. Some women made their way to England to be near husbands and brothers, and they worked as BADS or the Voluntary Age de Aid de Detachment and with the Red Cross. Many nurses enlisted in the Army Nursing Corps. Others paid their own way to England and found nursing positions there in France. Jessie Trail, she was a young VAD and she worked in England and she also was in France. She actually had a home in France and supported the soldiers there. When she came home, she continued to support the nurses and soldiers. She was the driving force behind the Harkaway World War I Memorial to the Men and the original planting of an avenue of flowering gum trees at Harkaway in memory of all the nurses who lost their lives overseas. Nurse, later matron, Nora Roden, gave devoted service to soldiers in Egypt and France. And between the wars, she continued working at the Caulfield Military Hospital and the Anzac Hostel. In, nine, in World War II started, she established the Stonington Red Cross Convalescence Home. While the men were away, the families and communities provided support from afar. For many young couples, when the man enlisted, families quickly organized weddings. Maybe it was to keep the men fondly thinking of home. Maybe it was from the woman's perspective that he wouldn't stray. On the 22nd of December 1915, the newspaper reported the marriage of Arthur Polson and Edith Pratt as a military wedding. There were five groomsmen, all the men served in the Australian Army Medical Corps. The cake was suitably decorated with miniature soldiers in tents with flags of the Allies. The six men sailed in 1916 in June. A year later, Edith received the news that her husband had died of wounds. 
She had no children and was awarded a pension of 22 shillings a fortnight. By the end of the war in 1919, a widow would receive a pension of two pounds. The first reports in our local paper for the Patriotic Fund was on the 3rd of September 1914. A total of 28 pounds was raised that week. People held concerts to raise the funds and it was reported in the paper. Things like Tumut Valley Orchard, eight pounds. Berwick, 10 pound. Pakenham Dandy Nong football match raised six pound. At the Combined Churches fundraiser, Mr. A.S. Churnside offered 20 pound for every one pound donated. That resulted in 252 pounds and 14 shillings raised that night. So this was updated weekly in the paper. The innovation of a Queen's Carnival allowed sisters and sweethearts to raise money in a parade of the Queen's. They also sold ribbons to raise money. Myra Leeson took part in the Queen Carnival and she later married returned soldier Gus Fink. The women also came up with the idea of the soldier's box. They'd nominate a soldier and then collect money in his name. The winner, obviously the soldier with the most. One of the soldiers nominated was Alexander Leckie. His name raised 53 pounds. He died of wounds on the 14th of November, 1918. The paper kept track of donations to the Red Cross Fund, the Belgium Relief Fund, the British Red Cross Fund, and numerous other funds. There was also physical donations. School children and women knitted thousands of socks there was many publications of what pattern to use to make your socks or your balaclava. They also provided comforts for the men. It might be a writing pad and pen. Later, they collected flannel, flannel, which was for bandaging. And as the war progressed, there was a great need for pajamas. Non-perishable food was also sent from home and it was the founding of the great Anzac biscuit recipe. Boiled fruit cakes would keep long enough to get to the front. Fathers collected for the tobacco fund. They donated pipes and tobacco. The soldiers' milk fund accepted tins of condensed milk. All the donations had to be coordinated through a local group, then to Melbourne and then overseas. Another army of predominantly women organising comforts for the boys overseas. As the dead and wounded list grew, it was understandable that some parents felt bitter that apparently able young men had not enlisted. When David Bethune died, his parents' anguish was very apparent in his death notice in the newspaper. It finished with the words, better a soldier's grave in France than a shirker's grave at home. David was one of the many men reported missing it from Mel. It was a year before the army confirmed he was believed dead, not missing. And in 1921, they advised his mother that they had no idea where he was buried. One issue that caused great consternation for many women was dealing with the understanding the army bureaucracy. Many soldiers made an allotment from their army pay to a wife, a mother or sister, and sometimes an elderly father. However, if the soldier ran afoul of the army regulations, his pay would be docked. And so the allotment to a loved one would also be docked or stopped. This might not be noticed if it was only one or two days because of a minor misdemeanor of not shaving and being late to parade. For the men who lost a week or more, in some cases months, the women were often left in great difficulty. This mostly happened when men went AWL or absent without leave. It could also be due to an injury or a health issue. Private Tula wrote to his sister asking for funds. She didn't know his pay had been stopped due to the number of times he'd been AWL. Thomas Stevenson lost 178 days pay during his 1,137 days of service. While a man might be considered a very reluctant soldier, Robert Gardman, he enlisted in June 1917. He first went AWL during training camp and was missing for eight weeks in Melbourne. He then fundamentally spent his whole time overseas, either missing or in detention. When he was sent to France, apparently the only shot he fired was into his foot. He was not discharged until the 6th of May 1920 with his file noted as service no longer required. 
thus not entitled to any service medals or war gratuity. The army considered self-inflicted wounds as a major offence, and while some men accidentally shot themselves in the foot, others did it literally. It was the thousands of men who suffered with venereal disease that caused the greatest problem for the army and confusion for those back home. They might get a message saying their soldier was sick or ill, but very little detail. However, the army found it necessary to send over 6,000 men back to Victoria for treatment at the Langwarren Hospital. The Langwarren camp was initially used to house enemy aliens. Believed to pose a threat to Australia, it could hold 500 men at a time. During the first year of the war, 769 Germans, 104 Austrians and 72 Turks spent time in this camp before most of them were moved on to camp in New South Wales by November 1915. A number of sons and grandsons of Harkaway's German families enlisted, but that didn't stop their fathers from being under suspicion of being German sympathisers and potential saboteurs. All the Harkaway cases were investigated by the government and the police and all proved to be malicious gossip and spite. There are files in the National Archives for Wanky, Koenig, Edibols and Hallier. In Harold Hilbeck's personal file is a letter from the Commonwealth Department of External Affairs confirming his parents were naturalised in 1909. And another one, Mr Meyer, he was Swiss, but that didn't stop or deter people from being suspicious of a foreign name. John and Lewis Beyer enlisted within days of each other in 1914. Their father was Prussian and he died a few years before the war started. While at home, their mother worked tirelessly fundraising for the Red Cross. John died at Gallipoli a week after the Anzac landings. While Lewis served through Gallipoli and the duration of the war, he typified the experience of many men. He married an Australian nurse in England he took up a soldier selectless box block on his return. He made a success of his farm. He was president of his local RSL, captain of his local rifle club, an advocate for soldier settlers against the government's rules. He enlisted again in World War II while his wife in this photograph worked for the Red Cross through World War II and was made a life member of her local RSL. The army considered men unable to fight due to VD, that it was a self-inflicted and every 1,000 men who could not fight meant there was a whole battalion not in battle. They got medical treatment, but their pay was stopped. For those men who were returned to Victoria for treatment, the army discharged them. Many then went and re-enlisted with a new service number and posted to new units. And they returned in many cases to the Western Front. The hospital at Lang Warren closed in 1921, and we found 10 local men who spent time in this hospital and nine of them re-enlisted. When the war started, the Australian Government Department of Defence was headquartered in Victoria Barracks on St Kilda Road. It was here where the Central Army Records Office, or Base Records, was established with a staff of three in October 1914. Major James Lean had two clerks. A year later, there was 140 clerks and one lady. By 1917, there were 300 staff and 133 women typists. There was also offices in Cairo and London. They were swamped in paperwork that needed to be filed, letters from families that needed to be answered. They also had to write to women who were claiming medals for lost sons asking them was there anyone closer to their son than them, such as their father. The male took priority. Notification of when troops would be returning, applications for a rail pass to meet them, the King's message, photos of greys overseas, return of a soldier's, soldier's personal property, dispatching medals and more. It left a detailed paper trail of every soldier. They handled each and every inquiry from family with thoughtfulness and compassion, and this extended to the returning soldiers while the repatriation department was established for their ongoing care. For the ordinary man or woman, the army seemed uncaring and inflexible. Jana Beckett, a recently widowed mother in 1922, went to the local post office 
to collect her late son's medals to be told they couldn't be handed to her as they were addressed to his father. She then had to go through the system to get them by proving she was the nearest next of kin. Communication from men overseas sometimes arrived home before the official military notice, and this resulted in sons riding home to say a brother was wounded or killed before the army had a chance to notify them. Some parents then wrote to their local MLA or their Secretary of Defence. Others just turned up at an inquiry desk at St Kilda Road. Timothy Halloran's mother wrote continually for a year to get confirmation. Suspense is very hard for us old people, she wrote. Albert and Prosper LaRue died a week apart. They were grandsons of a Frenchman. Prosper had no grave. Letters in his files show both sides of the acceptance and bitterness of a family. His grandmother wrote in 1921, I have no doubt his last resting place will never be known. We shall meet again at the last day. Letters in his file also were from his mother. In 1924, she wrote, declining her son's medals. She said, I think it is time the Defence Department ceased sending out these medals. It's a waste of public money. I take no comfort or interest in these trashy affairs. Likewise, James Stevens' father wrote many letters. He was confused that no one could tell him where his son was buried. And if so, why were there no personal possessions returned to him? In 1922, he was still writing to the military about his son. He was convinced he was alive. Another father wrote in anger that he had read of his son's fate in the newspaper and the army had not seen fit to tell him first. Without this false thought and organisation skills of Major Lean, this wonderful paper archive of a soldier's service would not exist. And we are fortunate these records have been preserved, digitised and made freely available through, for research through our national archives. Many children were born after their fathers set off overseas. In some cases, the men never held that child. Sylvia Harmer and Dave Purvis were both born uh, after their fathers had left and they only knew their fathers through their mother's memories and a photo of a man in uniform. Both their mothers did not remarry, as was the case for many widows. Private Albert Boxall was in hospital overseas when he heard the news of his son's birth. He'd been bitten by a camel. His son was born on the 25th of April 1916 and was appropriately named Albert Anzac Boxall. When Mary Byron heard the news of her son Edward's death in August 1918, she collapsed and remained unconscious for 15 days, dying on the 15th of September 1918. And one imagines many other parents died of heartbreak. Supporting the widows and bereaved parents mainly fell to the local church, the family and friends. The government paid a war widow's pension and an allowance for each child under the age of 16 if the soldier died overseas or shortly after his return. A mother could also apply and receive an allowance and they would receive the next of kin or mother's badge which had an attachment to hang off each son's name who was given his name in life in service. However, there's a cutoff date of 10 years after a man's return and the woman had to provide proof that a return man's death was due to his service, otherwise she received no financial support. This was the case for the wife of Samuel Sargent. He was medically discharged. He'd been suffering with dysentery, shell shock and influenza. He married in 1919 and died in 1939. The military said his death was not war related, leaving his wife with 12 children under the age of 18, owing money for a war loan on the house, the lease on the land, she was basically destitute. The local RSL and community rallied around. They loaned her a cow so that there was milk for the children. They raised money. They found work for the older children. They sorted her financial affairs and arranged the paperwork for the child welfare of the children under 16. Thomas Cook was a single man when he left for the war. He had an orchard on Army Road, Pakenham. He was a popular president of the local ANA branch. 
the members of the ANA banded together, arranging working bees at his orchard while he was overseas. When he returned, it was to a functioning property they had maintained for him. After they returned home, there was many struggles still. Of our 500 men, 107 did not return. 83 died on the Western Front, three died during training, two died during the 1915 meningitis outbreak at the Seymour camp. In a total of 70 men died during that outbreak and most of them are buried in Coburg Cemetery. 24 men returned with wives and one man had married a French lady. As the men returned home, they'd be presented at a welcome home gathering. They sometimes spoke of their experiences, they remembered mates lost and would often receive an engraved medal as a token of thanks from a grateful community. They would be very hard for families who had sons who had died, possibly harder for those families who maybe had only just waved by to a son. They knew what they were going to. In November 1916, the local newspaper reported that James Blackwood had gone to camp his two brothers were overseas and it was a fine example of families where none, two families where none have volunteered. It would often be the case that on one weekend there'd be a welcome home at the hall, the next weekend it would be a farewell. Returning home was bittersweet for many men. They left brothers and friends behind on battlefield cemeteries. Others came home on hospital ships with physical and mental injuries. Some received a pension, depending on what the medical assessment classification gave as their disability and work options. Would it be permanent or over in six months? Thomas Cullen was assessed in 1917 and granted a pension of 30 shillings, while James D assessed at the same time received a pension of 15 shillings. Many amputees trained at the Workmen's College, later known as the RMIT. They held classes in boot and shoe repairing, basket weaving, and other things that might be helpful for a man to get employment. A shop window might display a sign that said returned soldier in the hope that the community would support him. Charles Koenig was one of the many amputees who went into business as a boot repairer. He had a welcome home gathering, and it would probably have been at that occasion that his family received an engraved medal in memory of his brother, Tom. Tom died at Polygon Wood. It was sad to see in 2014, Tom's medal and the other memorial journal jewelry sold at auction. Was there no one left in his family? We hope not. We like to think that things found their way back to a relative. When the government established soldier settlements, only a small number of men who took up this option had farming experience. Many would later walk off the farm due to poor soil, floods, lack of productivity, health issues and more. A good indication of where these farm areas are is the Soldiers Road. Around us we have them in Berwick, Beaconsfield, Clyde North, Lang Lang, Pakenham South, Jimbrook, just to name a few. Maps and informations of many soldier settlements and settlers have been digitised and they're available through the Public Records Office in Victoria. You look under the Battle to Farm and you'll find a map that pinpoints where the man's farm was and links to his records. 45 of our local men took up soldier settlement blocks. R.S. Adamson attended a social welcome home in 1919, and he then farmed on Soldiers Road at Beaconsfield. James Calvert farmed his dairy property at Cooeyrup successfully for 35 years, while Thomas Kempster struggled at Pakenham South for six years. Eventually, he forfeited in 1924. In his letter to the authorities, he wrote, for sooner would I suffer in France again, rather than at the hands of the Closer Settlement Board. Percy Pepper was a returned Indigenous soldier and he had a soldier's block at Kuira. He had seven children. His wife had been sick for a number of years. He endured flooding. When his wife died, he could no longer keep up the payments and he walked away. His brother-in-law, Harry Thorpe, was also an Indigenous soldier. He was married with two children. He was awarded the Military Medal 
He was wounded twice and he was killed in action in 1918. They were just two of an estimated thousand Indigenous men who served. The soldier settlement and later the closer settlement had mixed results for men. By 1937, 60% of all men who had registered had walked off the land. Many men named their home or property after the troop ship that carried them safely home. Robert Bain named his house the dugout. He later developed a subdivision and he named all the streets after troop ships. William Mundy was one of the men who returned home to find that his wife had formed a relationship with someone else while he was away. He then divorced her. While many young women struggled with husbands who had changed by their experience and they had to renew relationships. The Ridgeway family had 31 members of their extended family serve overseas. Only one did not return home. To some extent, neither did one other. Thomas came back a mental invalid from shell shock and was lovingly cared for by his family. All the while, newspapers reported the wounding and deaths of countless young men. In October 1919, a notice was placed in the paper by the Alloway family remembering six men. William, 1917, Buller Court. Albert, 1917, Passchendaele. Alexander, 1918. Charles, 1918, Monson Quinton and Charles died at sea, 1915. Other men died after they, they returned home with physical injuries. Hugh McNaughton died only a month after he returned. William Lyons came home with a severe form of blood poisoning. In 1922, he was a resident of the Anzac Hostel. He required care as a severely incapacitated serviceman. He died at Caulfield Military Hospital in 1928. Others struggled mentally. Myra Fink was secretary of the Yellow Red Cross. And as I said, she had married a returned soldier. She and Gus had no children and they both struggled with mental health. Gus wrote in a letter to his brother, Myra's head is gone and mine is the same. I can't think this is worse than the war. They were found dead in their kitchen. It was officially on a man's record recorded as neurasthenia sometimes a shell shock, and today we would call it PTSD. Archibald Hansom was in the field ambulance and he was awarded for bravery. He was standing next to his mate when his mate was killed beside him. This shock, shock no doubt would affect anybody. He was in hospital in June, 1918, and then reported AWL from the 4th of November, 1918 to the 3rd of March, 1919. He was court-martialed and sentenced to five months prison. He returned to Australia on ship. Duty was nursing the wounded men. In 1924, in an initiative to help the returned soldiers and settlers, the Better Farming Train was established. It made its first tour to Gippsland and the first stop was at Bunyip. The train would then go on to make 38 tours of regional Victoria, the final tour in 1935. The Gippsland area had a lot of dairy farmers, so visits there covered every aspect of the dairy industry, from the care of the life shock, the machinery developments, milking, butter, cream and cheese manufacturing. In the Wimmera, the emphasis was more on wheat and crops. The train carriages were painted a bright yellow, so they stood out. Initially, there was 15 carriages, it was later extended to 18. The aim was to educate and help cater for the needs of the farming communities. Both men and women attended the talks and demonstrations. The women had their own dedicated carriages with talks and demonstrations on health and hygiene, child and baby care, cooking and household care, how to be thrifty. For many women, especially the English brides, it was an opportunity to meet with other women as they could sometimes go months without seeing another female. Some men returned home and became pillars of their local community. Oh, sorry, I missed that lovely slide. I love those ladies climbing up the steps in their heels. Some men returned home and became pillars of their local communities. 
John Cardell and Les Cochran were two. John was president of his local RSL and organised the RSL Carnival. He was trustee of the Soldiers Memorial Hall, which he was the driving force behind. And he was on the local foreshore committee, apart from his homework uh, on his property and his family, he was a busy man. Les was also very involved with the RSL. He was a JP and he was a member of Victorian's parliament. His community saw him honoured with an OBE in 1971. It wasn't long before after the landing at Gallipoli, the groups formed to honour those serving and those that died. Elizabeth Asling was secretary of her local soldiers memorial committee for many years. They also formed groups to care for service families. William Mead's widow had three young children, but that didn't stop her from becoming the first treasurer of the Soldiers and Sailors War Widows Association, a role she would hold for 16 years. Articles appeared in newspapers asking for the names of men who had gone overseas to be collected so suitable memorials could be erected. Schools collected the names of former students and businesses did the same. The education department published a large book with the names and a photo and a short biography of every teacher and every education department man who served and enlisted in Victoria. There were honour boards and honour rolls that adorned local halls and churches, schools and businesses. Many towns planted avenues of honour. While William Smith returned home, he was classified with a 40% disability. He found work with the Country Roads Board and was employed to plant rows of poplar trees from Berwick Hill at Narry Warren and at Hallam. Towns built memorial halls and at Kuirup they built a memorial hospital. The government built our Shrine of Remembrance. The men who built it were predominantly returned soldiers. The granite was quarried locally in Tainong and many simple and not so simple public statues and memorials sprung up around the state. One of the most recognised monuments is of the soldier, head bowed over his gun, standing on a tall plinth. Local soldier Arthur Rex Fell of Cockatoo was the model for three different versions of this statue. One can be seen on the foreshore at Beauty Spot in Carrum. Another is at Upper Coomera Memorial in Queensland. Arthur and his four brothers are also remembered on a simple plaque on a stone at Cockatoo. Before the war had ended, the returned soldiers, Imperial League of Australia, today known simply as the RSL, was formed in 1916. His aim was to ensure that there were programs in place for the well-being and care, the compensation and commemoration of serving and ex-service Defence Force members and their dependents, and it was a place for men to gather. Legacy was formed in Melbourne in 1923 and was initially run by returned soldiers to support the widows and children. The organisation still exists today and continues to support the families of deceased or injured servicemen and women. Next year will be the 100th anniversary of Legacy in Victoria. In 1939, when World War II commenced, many returned soldiers stepped forward again on the home front. Some served overseas again. Many watched as their sons left for battle in foreign lands. It's hard to imagine what these men and women must have gone through mentally, knowing the horror of one war and waiting for a soldier's son to return from another. Some, such as my uncle, found it too much and they lost their mind. He thought the cows in the paddock were tanks and started shooting at them. Other men, such as Major Henry Glover, took a gun and walked out into a paddock and did not return. And well, should we always never forget their service. Most of the resources I've used today, the photos come from the Australian War Memorial. The information predominantly comes from the five books published by the Narry Warren and District Family History Group of our cemetery walks at Berwick, Pakenham, Harkaway, Cranbourne and Lang Lang. Other information came from the State Library of Victoria, Museums Victoria Collection, which is online, 
And of course, National Archives, Australian War Memorial and the Public Records Office. This cover here is actually the back cover of our five books. Thank you for listening. <laughs>